Hi, everyone. So this is a series of webcasts based on the work of Steve Denning. Um, so this is the second dimension that is about the mechanics of adapting uh, to the rapidly shifting conditions for those business that cannot continue to operate. Um, so firms that are well along in digitizing both internal workflows and using agile practices have generally found working from home a relatively, relatively uh, easy transition. So today we have here uh, Riot Games that were able to operate virtually by working from home through Zoom and other shared technology they will share with us today. So the moderator for this webcast will be our friend Michael Karkin. He's the Chief Marketing Officer at Scale Agile. Um, we have Hakmed Sidki from uh, Head of Business Agility at Riot Games and the President of IC Agile. Christopher Imes, the CISO for and Head of Enterprise IT at Riot Games. Uh, Brett Perota, uh, the VP of Product Management at Cerner, and Jason Ortmeyer, the VP of Talent Development at Mortensen. So we will have the World Agility Forum by the end of September, 26th and 27th. Um, we have the uh, Agile Awards. Uh, the nominations are still open. Um, so we will have further information during the webinar and up. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and broadcast live uh, on our channel on uh, Facebook. So thank you all for joining us. It's a really honor and pleasure having you all here with us. So Michael, now I pass the ball to you. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today to moderate this great panel. Um, as you said, the topics today are the mechanics of adaptation. And I, we've got a really interesting panel. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but I have a question. Please, please start with your name, your company, and your role. And then on a kind of one to five scale, how ready were you for all this stuff when it got started? So, Brett, maybe I can start with you. Sure. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, as noted, I'm Brett Baroda. I'm Vice President of Product Management for Cerner Corporation. Uh, we're one of the largest healthcare IT companies in the world. Um, we employ about 27,000 associates uh, around the world with three main development organizations, uh, main, main campuses in Kansas City, Missouri, um, also in Malvern, Pennsylvania, right outside Philadelphia, and then we have a large presence in Bangalore, India. Um, so we've had an interesting, um, interesting time with the transition of managing across those large development centers. And I would say, but, on, but I would say on a scale of, do you say one to 10? Um, we were probably about a seven, seven to eight, actually, and so we definitely can go into more detail on that later. Good. Ten-point scale is perfect. Chris, how about you? Hey, yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Chris Himes. I'm the uh, VP of Information Security and Enterprise IT at Riot Games. Uh, as our uh, company name tells, we make video games, the largest of which is a game called League of Legends, which uh, has a lot of players through, throughout the entire world. Uh, we also have several other games that have been released recently. Um, I would say that uh, from a scale of, of 1 to 10, I have the challenge of having uh, Ahmed here, who's, who hopefully won't conflict with what I have to say, but I, I, would, give us, I would give us a 7 or an 8. Um, and a seven or eight, just because of the way, especially Ahmed has built uh, agile frameworks and methodology and into Riot's thinking um, is what allowed us to, to get everyone home uh, safely and keep the business moving. Super. Well, that sounds like I'd lead into Ahmed. So why don't you come and comment <laughs> more Ahmed on your, on your view here? Sure. Um, my name is Ahmed Sipke. I'm the head of business agility at Riot Games. Uh, Chris talked about Riot. And uh, yeah, no, Chris, I, I agree with you. I think we're, we were a seven, eight. Um, on the on the readiness scale there, and uh, it was uh, it was new surprises came out when when this you know um, situation came came to bear. But uh, I think the, the the muscle of agility that we've built over the years have has really um, paid off. Um, and then with IC Agile and the the other organization sort of uh, that I'm representing, the we were always a virtual team. And so that was a, an easier transition. So I'd say we were more on the, the nine to nine and a half <laughs> uh, scale there. Uh, nice. Thanks, Ahmed. Jason, what about you? Yeah, hi, I'm Jason Ortmeyer, and I uh, lead all of the people processes, particularly around uh, talent acquisition and development at a company called Mortensen based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. 
We have about uh, 8,000 team members uh, scattered across from East Coast to West Coast of the United States. And our primary business is in real estate development and construction. Uh, and so uh, I'll give us a, a six or a seven out of a 10 point scale as well, uh, but it's a tale of two different organizations. And I'll get into that a little bit later uh, between folks that were based in the office versus folks that were based on project sites. Oh, that sounds like a really interesting dynamic. And I think that leads into our first question for the, for the panel here, which is how big of a shock was the, 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 the speed of change and what were the first one or two things that you did to adapt? So Jason, why don't you continue and just talk about your kind of two-sided problem there? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, uh, safety is a value at Mortensen. And so our number one uh, sort of agile uh, dilemma was how are we going to ensure that we're going to keep team members safe? Uh, so that meant adapting to prevent uh, the spread of coronavirus, but also how to help uh, our, our team members adapt to the changes that uh, were in front of them. Uh, and, and realistically, you know, uh, with innovation uh, being a value and safety being a value, uh, we, we saw our construction teams adapt very, very quickly. Uh, we were able to uh, uh, maneuver things around and, and with uh, construction being an essential business in the United States, pretty much across the board, uh, we had very uh, few project delays uh, initially as it related to uh, COVID. Um, so uh, our team members were able to think about how do we do this differently? How can we do this with more spacing? How can we create physical barriers? Uh, but imagine uh, uh, building the, uh, the Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, with thousands and thousands of craft workers there every single day. Uh, it was really important that we focused on keeping them safe. And, you know, the good thing is we've been able to do that pretty darn well. Sounds really interesting. You know, Brett, you gave yourself a seven or eight. Were there any differences in the way you guys adapted and how big of a shock was it to you? Yeah, I, we, we had a tale of, um, tale of two stories as well, but from a little bit different perspective in that um, not, only, not only did we have to focus on the safety of our associates and, um, and our workforce, uh, we also are a major IT provider to the healthcare um, community. And a big portion of our um, associate base is our professional services consulting organization that spends 90% of their time in healthcare, in the healthcare system. Um, and so the combination of how we adapt to our office situation, um, as well as then how do we adapt to continue to support our clients who were also going through a massive transition and um, accelerating the use of IT um, into areas like virtual health, telehealth visits, et cetera, that we've seen numbers rise from 9,000 to 10,000% of increase in virtual visits in a month um, because they, they couldn't open their doors to see patients in office. So um, we had the combination of how do we manage our own associate population, which um, you know, I'd prioritize in a similar way that Jason did. We first focused on the safety, um, which instantly was stay home. Um, but we, in a matter of 48 hours, our biggest concern was just the overall technical infrastructure. Um, so we had a solid, we had deployed teams across um, our entire organization, which was, was great. Um, but just our VPN pipeline, um, the technical infrastructure to now have 27,000 employees um, hitting our systems remotely, um, we were not prepared for that. We were only at about 50% um, of associates working virtually versus in a physical location. And so we just didn't have the technical infrastructure in place. Um, but our internal IT teams did an amazing job that 48 hours, they had, they had evaluated what was needed. Um, and in the next 48 hours, it actually implemented um, all of the additional hardware, technology needs, et cetera, to then shift quickly within basically a week um, to everybody working from home. Um, our Bangalore offices, though, had a little bit of a tail because we had some scenarios of just the network infrastructure that was outside of our control um, of our associates working from their, their home locations that was a little bit different. Um, which, took a, which took probably about two to three weeks to get back to normal productivity levels. Um, the next thing we focused on was to make sure we had the ability to manage um, our associates' productivity. So all of the, you know, 
your JIRA boards, your, your burn down charge, all the things that you're using to manage development. Um, we needed to see that at a different scale on a daily basis just to ensure, you know, how are we tracking that associates are being productive from home versus um, seeing them face to face every day. Um, and the best part was that I would put us as a nine to 10 and that we had all of the dashboards data information readily available. It just wasn't being distributed to the executive leadership the same way that it had historically been just managed at the team level. Um, so we had to put some processes in place to manage that. Um, the inverse, we learned a lot about just our software deployment to our clients um, when they had to start figuring out how to deploy technologies at scale, um, how to manage the pandemic from just uh, their surge, surge predictions, prediction models, um, and that varied by every region and city and um, metropolitan versus rural environment and flexing those models to provide them as much information as possible um, to understand what kind of volumes they would expect as we manage through those and our ability to our ability to deploy the software and changes quick enough um, in that environment um, is is driving a lot of change from us uh, from how we develop software now going forward. So you're both prepared technically to make some adaptation, but it sounds like you also had the people skills to do it as well. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Chris, how did that compare for you at Riot Games? What were the similarities and differences? Uh, I mean, I think honestly, most companies took a very similar approach. It was just really a matter of how effective were they at, at executing that approach and how quickly were their employees actually able to adapt. Mm -hmm. I would say at, at Riot, when we talk about what was the biggest shock, for me, the biggest shock was how well it worked. <laughs> like I, I, I was not estimating personally, you know, I, I had lower expectations of our success than actually occurred. Now we, we risk realistically uh, within two, you know, two weeks before the, uh, Mayor of Los Angeles sent everyone home on on March 16th. By the time the by the time the day before that happened, we had 92% of our Los Angeles-based employees already working at home. And that was because we have an office in China. We saw what happened there, and we had a little bit of a heads up of the the implications that it could have for the rest of the world. So we started talking about it a little earlier. Now, fortunately. Um, I'm also you know, the head of enterprise IT at Riot. And for the previous two years, one of our strategic objectives was to allow riders to work from anywhere effectively like they were in an office. So we would be flexible and be able to, to move. So we worked towards exposing a lot of our services out to the internet, beefing up our VPN, making sure a lot of our employees had, uh, had laptops. So all those folks were, we didn't have to make significant amount of changes. The, the larger uh, issues that we had is we have a lot of folks who require very specialized equipment to do their job. We have artists who have very large di digital notepads uh, that they, they, they draw on. We have composers who have very special sound booths. We run the world's largest esports, esports who do, do live broadcasts. Like we typically have those esports events that are live. So yeah, we have audiences there. So we had to figure out how do we get those folks to either home and working effectively, and how do we put on what are otherwise our live sporting events that our players love? So uh, we fortunately were able to adapt in both sides. We actually ended up giving riders the choice to bring their desktop and all their equipment home. And that was only able to happen because our IT and security teams were able to get all the appropriate controls in place. Uh, we were able to inform and train within a couple of days to execute. And then our esports immediately just pivoted and said, hey, uh, we're not going to be able to, we're, we're fortunately, we're digital, so we can do this stuff, we can stream these things, but we're not going to have audiences. It, it, was, it was actually pretty amazing. Uh, I would say what a 90% or 75% of all of our employees are in Los Angeles. The rest of them are spread across 20 something offices across the world. And we also empowered every country manager to, to make the decisions for each of their offices on their own uh, under a framework that we designed that could be executed across the world. Because coronavirus didn't impact every location at the same time in the exact same way. And because of we, we gave them that ability to work within a framework and make their own decisions, we saw those offices leave at the right time. Uh, like keep the right amount of employees working and we are able to be just incredibly flexible. Sounds really impressive. Sounds like at the end of the day, you're proud of your teams and your, and your readiness. 
I'm yeah. still I'm still super proud. I I'm, <laughs> I just I I could talk for hours just to how proud I am of of all the folks that put this this level of effort in. Ahmed, add your point of view here. What, what what's your view? Yeah. Your so company? just to to add to what Chris was saying, I think uh, Chris and his team did a phenomenal job, really getting us um, all. Um, productive at home and, and with the necessary equipment and, and, and all that. I'll, I'll talk sort of from the, the human perspective. The, the challenges we were having also at that time, um, in the history of Riot Games, we had launched one game. Um, at that particular moment in time, we were about to launch three new games. And so you can imagine the, um, the worry that people, uh, wait, wait a minute, this is the time we need to be together. This is the most important and critical time. What are we going to do? What is the impact on timelines? Uh, what about expectations to players? And really, this is where, from my perspective, um, years and years of really hiring the right people, where it's it's not a um, it's not a transactional relationship with the company or with with the with the the player, uh, you know, the customers. Uh, we call them. Um, it really is a matter of mission alignment, right? Like we are here for players and you saw that. You saw an initial sort of dip as people accommodated the typical J curve of change, right? But it was, it was to your point, Chris, it was fascinating. It was amazing how our teams like, like gathered that internal energy and like just crushed it, really. We, we launched all the games, uh, you know, we, we, I don't want to say even we're on time. Some games were ahead of you know schedule, uh, which was amazing, and uh, and it really talks to the the mindset. Uh, I think you know, uh, Jason, as you were talking about you know people, it, you know, there's the, the the hardware and the the logistics and all that, but then just the people's mindset. Are they ready for this change? Are they resilient? Are they um, you know, how are they going to take it? Uh, we had new teams building at that time. You know, new teams need that physical camaraderie going out to dinner together, but you don't have that. What do you do? How do you build um, that chemistry and connection and team bonding? Those were some of the, the real innovations that I think, um, you know, you, you started to see. And even when we had teams that were sort of hybrid virtual, they all knew they could hop on a plane and get together when things got tough. Now, okay, this is it. This is it for an unknown future. So how do we make this work? And, and you saw people truly innovate on, on, on team dynamics and team norms and, and all that. So, um, it, uh, you know, I think investing in um, hiring the right people, uh, that mission-driven, uh, uh, resilient adaptability, growth mindset, all of those things pay dividends uh, in, in times like this. That's really great insight, especially from the people side. I, I just want to share, I was on a call this morning with a client, a, a board of our, our best customers, and um, we asked them the question, you know, how, how satisfied are you with how you used your principles to adapt? You know, and 85% said, and I really relied on that with great degree to, to get through this. And so there is something about having that mindset kind of built in that, that puts you in a better position to, to deal with it. Um, you know, it's been a few months of intensive learning for all of us. So I'm curious, you know, what, what your observations have been about unexpected benefits of being all virtual that you hadn't anticipated. Again, I'll go through the table, maybe I'll reverse a bit. What about starting with Chris this time and we'll go the other way. Chris, what, what, what did you pick up on that was a, a surprising benefit or kind of revealed itself in this process? So I would say a, a very big benefit. Um, there's there's two major benefits. The first is um, we we actually have many we had many teams that I would consider to be remote just because we have so many offices across the world. So just within the the security team itself, we have people in several different states. They're in uh, Europe. They're in Hong Kong. So. One of the major things is being that LA being a hub is it made the individuals in Los Angeles understand the pain that other people in other time zones and regions who are remote actually have. And it's required us to pivot our, our style, how we conduct meetings to be more effective and efficient, more respectful of those of those folks in other global offices. 
and it's actually brought the team closer as opposed to further apart. So that was that was one of the, the great things. And then, of course, with with Los Angeles having significant traffic, we now have individuals who uh, have an, have two to three hours back in their day from from their commute. So I would actually say that our productivity is, is higher uh, with for many individuals today than it was previously. Super interesting. That's 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 really good insight. Brett, what about at Cerner? What what uh, what new insights did you guys pick up on her? What new power have you found in being remote? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we have some that are still yet to be um, yet to be enacted on, but I but we see the trend towards it. And then there's a couple that are extremely tactical. Um, you know, I'm with Chris. I think the we've just been blown away at the way that our teams have adapted into the virtual world um, and what they've picked up and how how productive everyone's been. But a couple of real tactical things is we we always struggled with um, PI planning, quarterly planning from a logistics and space perspective, right? It was an administrative nightmare of how are we going to schedule all of these associates to get together in the rooms together for a couple of days at the same time. And we instantly eliminated that challenge um, by being virtual. And, you know, the interesting part is, especially in my space, we're 50% um, Kansas City based and 50% uh, Bangalore based from a development associate perspective. So we already were half virtual from that perspective. Um, and our first quarterly planning cycle um, in this model was a resounding success um, for two reasons. One, we didn't have the burden of the administrative of trying to find how everybody's going to get together. And two, I don't know if others have noticed this, but um, forums around collaboration like that are much more focused uh, because you can't talk over each other um, through video technology. Um, somebody always has the floor. Um, thus, you're only hearing one conversation. You're only hearing um, those specific points and then you move on to the next points. And I think it's been a, a fantastic actual adjustment to get focused um, on the topics and the conversations at hand. Um, the, the second macro trend for us is that, uh, you know, we, we've learned that we can be successful in this virtual environment. Um, we have been a very traditional um, live in this location, um, be in the office. And well, I, I, I hate to say this because it's home for me, but um, it's challenging to attract strong IT talent to the Kansas City area. Um, it's not, you know, it's not the biggest hotbed for IT, uh, IT talent. And now that we have seen the successes that we have in a virtual world, um, we're seeing a great opportunity to be a little bit more flexible, um, to possibly be able to recruit um, and, and bring on um, higher quality talent um, across the coast or other areas that we maybe wouldn't have had access to by the restrictions of, you know, needing to be in Kansas City. Um, I think that's one that's going to have to play out over time, um, but it's one that we certainly see as a strategy going forward that we can we can open up our minds and open up our boundaries for talent acquisition. It's so interesting, the strategic possibilities that have been revealed in this process. Jason, you know, what other insights do you have adding, adding to these these so far? Yeah, for sure. And a lot of the ones that Chris and Brett talked about are, are ones that uh, definitely we experienced as well. But I think I'll focus on two new ones. One of them is around uh, continuing to live our mission. So Michael and Brett, you mentioned the sort of strategic uh, uh, element of this. Our mission is to create an exceptional customer experience and we hope to differentiate you know, uh, our, to, towards our competition as it relates to that experience. And so what this has allowed us to do is take more time to listen to our customers, uh, not trying to always just be there to, to answer and to do every single thing uh, that's necessary, but really to, to listen to how they needed to adapt and how the physical spaces that we can help them shape uh, may help uh, actually have their teams be more productive and effective as well. Uh, and so that sort of connection to the customer, I think has really deepened uh, over this time. Uh, and the second piece is, um, uh, despite the fact that folks are more dispersed than ever before, we've uh, intentionally had a very uh, significant increase in the amount of communication from the top. Uh, and so where we may have an occasional email message or a video uh, from the CEO and, the, and uh, his team, um, we're having regular conversations now that are really connecting and bringing folks together across the country in ways that we never imagined could before. 
So those two things I think would be additive to what we heard from uh, Brett and Chris. Ahmed, what extra insights or maybe switch yeah. to the question, what impediments are you seeing? Kind of balance those two together. What's the up and the downside of this whole thing so far for you? Uh, I'll start with the, the trend to benefits as well. <laughs> Um, but I'll talk about it from a sort of the, a holistic perspective across what I've seen with IC Agile, Riot, et cetera. And so um, just to give it by way of background. So with IC Agile, we had really bet on sort of virtual learning being a, a new trend. And this was before the whole COVID-19 um, situation. So we had um, really invested in what a virtual delivery of learning that is engaging and not just people looking at a camera and whatnot. Um, and it was interesting because there was some resistance to the investment needed in really creating an engaging virtual experience. The moment COVID-19 hit and physical, uh, you know, educational experiences were, were hindered, uh, you saw a, a um, really the community respond and truly invest in how do we create the most phenomenal virtual learning experience, which really created very innovative approaches of using technology like Zoom and others. But um, taking that also to what we've done at Riot, and, and uh, I think Brett, you were talking about this earlier, um, we have like senior leadership advisement sessions, right? Where we get input from 200 plus people. Okay, now it's virtual don't look at it as an impediment, look at it as an opportunity. What could we do that we couldn't do before? With Google Sheets and this, you could actually have people look at each other and actually collaborate much more intensely. And so I think this, this notion of um, looking at these challenges as opportunities and creative constraints um, and, and the, um, the creativity that we saw from people moving from physical, um, you know, education, uh, meetings, uh, you know, whatever, to virtual, um, I, think, I think it re-energized the creative juices in people. It's like, wait a minute, because we got into this routine of doing things the same way, almost by habit, and this just paused all habits and like, okay, I actually have to think, what can we do differently? What can we you know, construct from the ground up. The second thing uh, I think, and this will actually, you know, feed into, into both the, the challenges and the benefits is um, from a human perspective, really, I saw a lot of people discovering their whole self, right? A lot of people had, uh, you know, the, the, the work dimension uh, unbalanced with the non-work dimension. And I think just whether it was saving commute time, whether just being at home in between meetings, seeing their family, um, being engaged with their kids' school, whatever it was, I saw a lot of people really is like, wait a minute, I can actually make this work. I don't have to be um, extreme on either side with a little bit of adjustment here or there. And we saw how managers really were very understanding um, and, and managers took a, uh, and I won't say all, but many managers really took an empathetic stance and understanding different situations for people, whether now you have, you know, two parents working at home and they have to balance the kids and all that. I really saw some of the best in people uh, come out during this time. And I think that's, that's, that's huge. Um, the the, the right. downside of that, uh, sorry, Michael, was um, a lot of people couldn't also put boundaries uh, as it related to work. So, you know, physically when I left work, I left work. Now, wait a minute, um, work is always here. It's at my kitchen table. It's here, it's there, it's everywhere. And so you could see some people really discover their whole selves and some people get sort of, wait a minute, I'm actually working more hours, I'm more stressed. And so it was an interesting um, balance and, and education moment actually for people. On, on how to manage them. It's a, it's a great observation, you know, as, as it's all settled in, you know, I, I feel like I've been three and a half months at home now. Um, now you start to feel the, the differences in work behavior. What, what, what impediments or challenges have you seen that, that, that were maybe unintended consequences or unexpected consequences and how are you adapting to those? And I'll work my way back around. Jason, what about you? 
I think one of the things that you that you have we've been seeing more and more about now is Zoom fatigue, right? And so, uh, you know, before uh, this hit, I think we used to uh, relish opportunities to leverage technology like this to connect across groups. And, and now I, I've never been more thankful. Oh, it's just a phone call. Um, uh, and so I think, uh, it, you know, that, that's been one of those pieces where not only the, the, uh, the constant screen time, but also the, the, the self-consciousness and, 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 uh, about uh, how am I presenting myself and, and, uh, and uh, what's going on in my background and what am I sharing with my colleagues that I might not have shared before. I think that is, is one big piece. I think the other one for us, and I talked about the, the, uh, the sort of tale of two workforces earlier, is the differences in our construction teams and our office teams. You know, our construction teams continued to go to, the, to their work sites every single day. They continued to have to balance having kids at home and, and, and working uh, uh, at school uh, and not having the luxury of at being at home and working with them. And so despite the fact that many of us took that extra burden on and felt like it was burden, our construction teams had to do it in, in different ways. And they, had, they probably had the added uh, burden of uh, continuing to go into the, to their work site every day uh, and not having the same level of support at home. Yeah, all things blend together. Brett, what's your experience been at Cerner? Yeah, you know, um, I echo some of Ahmed's side of things on the, um, just the humanity of it, the empathy of it, and starting to be a little bit, you know, as a leader and as a manager, a little bit more conscientious of all the situations that our associates are dealing with um, and what they're working through. But on the flip side, I think um, the uniqueness of this situation wasn't just our work environment moving to this it was our whole world moving to this. Um, and so, you know, the, the biggest challenges that we've had to deal with um, in terms of associates is really a, an overall fatigue and burnout of really two things. One, it's the, you know, those with small children, maybe both parents working at home, daycares closed, um, childcare wasn't available, schools closed, you became, um, you know, you became, you know, my situation all of a sudden overnight, I became uh, vice president. I also became um, teacher. I also became um, stay at home dad. Um, and it was, you know, always on on all of those facets where you usually had some separation of those things. And I think the, the combination of all that happening at once has created some burnout for a lot of individuals. Um, I think if we got to a world in the virtual side just on work where um, the child care child side went back to how it was beforehand and a little bit more sense of normal Then you know, there's a, there's a different balance there. Um, the other side of it is, I think it was mentioned is when, when does the workday start and stop? Um, and I think, I think individuals have had challenges balancing that. And then the other one, and maybe this ties into what Jason was saying that we've gotten a lot of feedback on is that, you know, the, the virtual, the video meetings, um, I know for myself, it's one after the next, right? Um, and it's not that when I was at work and in the office, we were in meetings all day, but you had that five minute mental break where you had to walk from one meeting room to the next. Um, you might have had the opportunity to chat with somebody or, or to connect with somebody on a different topic or grab water um, as opposed to now it's, oh, that one ended at noon and 12.01, the other one they're expecting me there and you dial right into the next one, right? There isn't, a, there isn't a start and stop in some of them like there is when you're in the office to um, socially connect with somebody else on some of those aspects. And I think depending on the person and the individual, you know, this gets into probably the introvert, extrovert conversations of, you know, this works for some and not others. Um, and how do you start to put in and re-enter, um, which is what we're dealing with a lot on, how are we going to re-enter? Um, and how do you go about addressing that where some are actually really comfortable in this environment, but um, some really need to get back into the office because of their personality type and what they need and um, how you provide resources to your teams to, to, manage, to manage that effectively and address their needs and work through that is, you know, just something that's still in the forefront of, forefront of our minds. I think one of the interesting things, sorry to jump in, Michael, is that it, it's really minimized our, our uh, drop bys or hallway conversations that you used to have. And that informal part of our culture that really builds trust and relationships. And so we've been relying, you know, consistently on, on platforms like Zoom and others to, uh, to collaborate, but um, we're missing some of that informal connection in the current environment. 
Yeah, that's a great observation. That's been my frustration is the, uh, I did not realize how much on the fly coaching, discussing and collaborating I was doing. And so it just feels less efficient for me. Um, I'm gonna kind of switch us back to our last question and then get ready for the Q and A here in about six minutes. Um, you know, we, we, we did a quick survey of our population recently and, and you got what I call three audiences. Some folks are like, I'm good, home is great, talk to you later. I got another group is like, get me back in the office before my head explodes, please. This is really driving me crazy. Like I need to get out of here and on a plane. And a group in the middle going, I don't know, are the conditions right yet or not? You know, you kind of got those three audiences. So what it tells me is that the next phase is going to be blended somehow. It's going to be some mix, interesting mix as we get in the next phase. As you guys look at the next phase of where we're going in, in this sort of not purely virtual, not purely in-person world, you know, how are you getting ready to adapt for that? You know, talk about one thing that you, that you have on your mind that you know you have to address, and then let's get to the Q&A here at the, at the quarter, quarter of the hour so we can take some questions online if that's okay. all right. Um, you know, Chris. Sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I can hop in, um, and maybe oh, it's ahead, two things. Oops, sorry, Chris. No, please go ahead. Yeah, you know, it's there's there's twofold. One is the you, you know there's the there's the being respectful of you know even even the pandemic and the situation around um, COVID. Everybody has a different viewpoint on the status of it, right? Right, and so you've got to find the balance of how to be respectful of the even the you know, even the guidelines and guidance is, is different in our situation. What's interesting for us is we're split between two states and one state views it one way and the other state views it another. So the regulation state by state of what we can and can't do is, is different, um, which really puts people into a quandary and kind of question, okay, what, what should we be doing? Um, and so what we're trying to really ponder and trying to figure out is, okay, when we come back um, at a minimum, is it, do we, can we only come back at 50% capacity because there has to be this level of separation in the office? Um, and so what does that look like? Then, then who do you pick um, to be that 50% um, from a capacity perspective, right? You, you, logically, you wanna pick whole teams so that whole teams are together and back in that environment. But then back to the, the previous conversation, you have individuals that are perfectly comfortable at home and then you have those that are itching to get back in. Um, do you open it up voluntarily to say, hey, those that want to come back in, um, come back in. Those that are comfortable at home, stay home. Um, because then the, the second derivative thought process there is, if you don't fully do one or the other, um, then is the reality, it's just your workspace and it's still a completely virtual environment, right? If, if at the end of the day to collaborate with your team, but I'm sitting in my office and I still just have to do a video conference because 50 plus percent of the team is still virtual. So to get everybody together, it's just video anyway. What's the value in being in the office at all? <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably just posing a lot of questions back as opposed to answers uh, because that's the state of where we are, right? Those are the, those, that's the dynamic um, that we're at right now is, you know, what does it really look like? What drives that decision? Because I, I do think there is a reality where it isn't a full 100% anytime soon or ever. Um, and so then is, does that swing it all the way to one pendulum of going into the office as the voluntary um, because that's where you're more comfortable versus those that, those that aren't? Yeah, so uh, from, from a riot perspective, we, we had all those questions. But what, since we know that we don't know the answers and things are dynamic and are good change, we just made a call. And the call we made is we just created a four-phased approach. The first phase, which we're actually starting right now, is uh, people who need specialized equipment to do their jobs, we're going to bring them back. We're going to let them come back. Phase two is work from home is strongly encouraged. But if you really, really, really want to be in the office, we're going to enable you to do so. And that phase could go on for a long period of time. Phase three is where we're going to say, hey, we would like you to return. But if you don't want to, that's okay. And then phase four is what we're calling new normal. And new normal could be there's a vaccine, everyone returns. It could be we buy additional office space so we can return to full capacity. It could be we discover that all engineers actually are highly effective working remotely. So we're not going to call it a phase of anything. We need to end at some point. So we're going to say, hey, engineers now work remote. Other people like game designers might return to the office. 
And that approach actually has received incredibly positive feedback because of just the flexibility that it has. We know for a fact that we can only fit 66% of our previous capacity with social distancing requirements on our, our Los Angeles campus. And today, we actually are go undergoing a three-month complete, um, what we're calling blank slate of our campus. And that is where our facilities teams are packing up every single desk. We are cleaning them. We are rearranging them to the new, what is the new normal. And we are allowing people to come in and pick up their stuff. And that is because we actually don't know if the answer is to bring back complete teams or if it's to let one type of role stay home. And it actually might be hybrid. We might find that an R&D team who's developing a new game needs to be in one space to collaborate. But an established game or an established team with really good cultural norms uh, with a defined roadmap may be able to be uh, spread across. And this might change consistently. So the biggest thing that we care about right now is having the framework and the base in which we can do anything that we need when the business needs it. And that's what we're working towards. And I'll just, I'll add to that. I think what's really important, I think, as people come back is to understand that it's not going to be as it was, right? That That is, uh, uh, I think, the most dangerous mindset in all of this. It's, we're going back to normal. We're going back, no. It, it is a new mindset. It is a new world. And the as a facilitator, I always dreaded hybrid. Um, all physical, all virtual, easy to solve. But hybrid was always my nightmare. Uh, and I think this is going to be the the challenge for everyone, um, scrum masters, coaches, delivery people, anyone who really um, designs process, how do you design or redesign from, from, the, from the ground up, um, assuming a hybrid first mindset, right? Not a physical first and then add virtual people or vert, like it really needs a hybrid first mindset. And I think that's gonna be um, where, again, we hope to see more and more creativity from people, but it's not, the mindset shouldn't be we're going to go back to normal and see how we accommodate people that are virtual. The one thing that I would add on to that is that right now is an opportune time for us to um, intentionally invest in our culture. Uh, and, and when you're thinking about culture, what Chris talked about was just beautiful as it relates to providing clarity uh, for our team members, providing uh, an, an understanding about what the future may look like and what some of the steps and stages could be. Uh, but also really taking into account what matters to them. And so, you know, having that dialogue with, with, with our team members about uh, what's, what's important, what's going to work for them, how do they see things evolving. Uh, but most importantly, um, you know, if we don't intentionally invest in our culture right now, it will take off in ways that we don't potentially want it to go. And so uh, I love how the, the, the panelists are really talking about uh, that sort of intentional investment in culture uh, and uh, and bringing their team members into the decision making process. Yeah, and I know that we're at the end of this time. And one to that point, today, in fact, we're actually sending out a survey that basically is asking folks what they want to do, because I can't determine that for them. So we want to hear back and then use that data to make informed decisions. And I'm really excited to get that that data. It's been a super interesting conversation. I, I, I've really been impressed with the, the caliber of the thinking and the caliber of the execution of all of your companies and what you've done. It's almost down to working agreements, like what do we agree we're going to do with each other in the future and, and using agile principles to make sure we're ready for whatever that future turns out to be because we're still not quite sure. Um, I, I would like to open up the questions. Uh, so if you're in the audience and listening, there's a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, at least on mine, that says Q&A. I think you could ask a question in there and then we'll queue those up for the audience, for the, for the panel to, to discuss. There's one there already. Uh, so I'm just gonna lay it up here and see if one of you wants to take it. Um, the, uh, the novelty of uh, quarantine and working from home is sort of worn off and we're now seeing at our company um, fatigue, um, harder to get team members to engage and speak up during meetings. You know, what have you seen or done or seen successful at kind of keeping collaboration going and kind of getting over the hump here? I know I paraphrased that, but uh, would one of you like to take that question and kind of add, add a thought or two on how that might be addressed or what you've done to be successful in that area? I'll start taking a crack at it. I think Thank you. Um, uh, variety, right? Like you, you especially in, in virtual, I think there's uh, 
we get used to, okay, we're going to open Zoom, we're going to collaborate, right? Um, and someone's going to open a Google Doc and we're going to do this. I, I have found that the investment in virtual collaboration is 3x um, the investment and preparation needed for physical collaboration. And so where I see a lot of the um, energy deplete and, and to, to, uh, to Shelly's point about the new car smell, yeah, great, we're collaborating, oh my God, we're doing this and that. Yeah, it's gonna get it's gonna get meton it, it's gonna get boring very very quickly, and it's gonna go out of fashion very very quickly. the The art here is how do you um, engage different tools, different um, collaboration styles, different virtual designs from uh, Zoom and 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 you know Google Suite to Mural to Miro to to very different tools just to actually keep things fresh. That's, that's one dimension. The other dimension is um, continuing to invest in the human connection. Um, actually, I think that's even more and more important as we continue to go virtual. Every um, session I have or facilitate or work with, even if it's the same people, we start with a check-in question. Why do we start with a check-in question, even though it's just an hour meeting? Because people need to check in. <laughs> because guess what? Um, I don't have that walk by, how you doing, how are things going? I don't have that. I need to consciously design for more human to human interaction. I actually tell people, take the virtual backgrounds off. We're not going to do that right now. But I found it fascinating how seeing into people's houses and homes creates a, a, an interesting bond between people, right? It's like, what's that? Oh, I have that or that, or that's your cat, that's your dog. Like, continuing to just intentionally design for um, variety, more human interaction and so forth would be, um, but it's, it's not easy. It actually requires a lot more time. Yeah, I think that yeah. one, one thing to add to that is just, you know, focus on inclusive behaviors. And, you know, Brett mentioned earlier, sort of introverted, extroverted folks. And I think right now our introverts are really, really tired. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that we, we need to do is make sure that we give them time to prepare. You know, we, we ask them, how do they want to be involved in this particular project? Where can they make the best uh, 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 contribution? And so giving them adequate time for reflection and self-work uh, can be a great way to help uh, minimize some of the fatigue that no doubt a lot of, uh, of folks are feeling. I would challenge that it's just our introverts. I think everyone's really tired. Like, I, I, I'm an extrovert. I'm tired. And you know what? I didn't realize, I truly didn't realize the impact of the consistent bad news and the pressure and wanting to deliver and kids at home. And, and, and I didn't realize the impacts that those things were having on me until I just had this epiphany. I'm like, I'm not myself. And we, multi we should multiply that and assume that every single one of the people we work with is feeling something similar. And we just, every day, there's no good news, right? Like, so when, when, when I see people aren't speaking up, I attribute that to stress and pressure and people just needing to talk to people, needing to feel human again. So Ahmed, thank mm -hmm. you for raising up the human equation of that. And the way we've been handling that is just our managers, we've just been having more and more one-on-ones. And I know it's more meetings, but realistically, we've been using them not to talk about work, I'm using yeah. them to talk about life and what's, what's bothering you and building those connections. And the, the things that begin to come out that you learn about the other person and then the things that come out of you, you'll actually be surprised because I think when, as leaders in companies, we're frequently not asked the questions that we ask other people. And we don't think about ourselves in the way we, that we try to support others. And when you realize what you're feeling, it gives you stronger empathy for everybody else. Yeah. Another great question online that I'd like to, to raise if I can from Christiane, um, you know, will we have more insights, guidelines, and coaching on how to continue on the new normal as part of the Agile Manifesto or the principles? Is, is there a need to update and modernize the principles to reflect the new normal, or are they, are they, are they good enough as they are? What do you guys think, right? I see Zachman exactly shaking his head no, so I'm going to start over there and see what reaction I got. So that's good. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if I was supposed to start or not, but I, I think the Agile Manifesto was a great document at a point in time, right? Okay. I don't think we should continue to uh, 
update it or, or, or try to add amendments to it or, or this or that. I think, I think, you know, we can come up with new documents today. Um, again, and, and the Agile Manifesto is close to 20 years now, um, if you really think about it. So I, I don't think that the goal is to update the Agile Manifesto. I think the goal is to understand, and by the way, I think from day one, the Agile Manifesto wasn't really just about these principles. It, it always, uh, for me at least, in my understanding from, from even the authors, it was about the mindset. It was about the mindset of adapting. And I think the, to, to truly uphold the spirit of the manifesto is to adapt to the current reality that we're in. And the current reality that we're in, we've been talking about for the past hour, um, but I don't think we need to go back and try and update the manifesto because I think it will get out of date really, really quickly. Uh, we have new crises coming up every day. Uh, who knows what the world will look like? So I think, I think being grounded more in the mindset and, and the set of values, I think that's where people really need to focus. And I hope this is a, a wake up call for, for a lot of the people that implemented Agile at a doing level and were more focused on the practices than the mindset and values, because that's where it will shine today. It's not in the, oh my God, we didn't have a stand up or this or that. It's, can you truly adapt to the big changes that are happening in the world today? Or are you actually stuck um, in, in the way you've been there? Uh, you're, you're muted, Michael. That was a great answer. Thanks for that. Is there room to adapt the way we coach? Is there, are there things we should be doing differently in this new environment? I'll let someone else answer. Yeah, I think I can jump in there a little bit. I think um, I think there probably are some tendencies that were that were very focused that that coaching was around collaboration and connection and what that looked like. I think just the the tools that may be leveraged to integrate into that coaching of what you what what is being used and leveraged to collaborate with teams is probably more of where coaching will probably evolve. Um, and maybe some of these other cultural dynamics that we've talked about, right? How do you infuse some of these more um, empathetic, um, you know, empathetic approaches into just the day-to-day -day processes um, that can become more of the norm? And do you actually coach to those type of cultural shifts and cultural changes? Um, I think those are going to be the main things. I think the, the core tenets of what you have to, what you use to execute and what you use to, to deliver um, those principles don't change at all, right? Um, but I think how the team engages and, and what that looks like is probably going to evolve how coaching needs to evolve um, around those different dynamics and, that, and aspects. To me, coaching's all, always been about making space for folks to talk about their experience. And, mm. and as, we, as we, you know, evolve into whatever this new normal looks like, folks are going to need that space, whether it's to talk about how tired Chris is, which I... I you know, completely agree with or, or the challenge that the team is facing or whatever it might be. It's as leaders, it's up to us to help us make the space for them to talk through that. Yeah. And I'll, I'll actually tie, tie that back to the previous question too, around how do you keep teams motivated and what does that look like? And one of the things that we're doing and that we've realized, especially at the executive leadership level is, um, you've got to find new ways and mechanisms to communi continuously communicate the mission and the strategic direction um, because strategies, strategies will forever evolve. Um, and in this world, you've got to take a hard look at how often and how you're communicating um, your strategic direction and your, and your evolving strategies um, to keep the teams energized and aligned to those things. Because one of the things we've realized is as a leadership team, we, we collaborate and think about, you know, maybe six, 12, 18 months out while the teams are executing in the current three months. Um, sometimes teams get exposure to those things when you're in the office because, you know, they, they happen at certain events or individuals see them. Um, and we found you have to make a conscious effort um, to re-engage and communicate more regularly on the mission and strategies that you're driving to. Um, to keep the teams connected to that. So, you know, we're moving from six month, um, you know, twice a year town halls to quarterly town halls. Um, we're moving to, you know, broader leadership team 
meetings on a, a biweekly basis um, to be connected to those strategies. So we're seeing kind of some of the governance and the, the broad org communication strategies around other things evolve um, and become more frequent than what they, than what they previously were when we were, when we were together more often. Super question. If you're not, if you're not exhausted communicating, you're not communicating enough. That was what an old boss said to me, right? Was, right. If you're not sick and tired of it, you haven't done as much as you should have. Um, there's another question here. I'm going to take it and see if you guys can add to it. It's related to what you guys said is everybody's kind of tired. Team members are saying they're, they're working harder. They're not taking breaks. You know, the question here is, is it a capacity issue and should we not, should we be changing our capacity calculation and reducing the load is a prioritization issue. And what, what, what do you guys think we should be doing to address this, sense of fatigue and people having more on their plate than they can handle. Is all the above the incorrect answer? <laughs> so uh, you know, just, just, I'll, I'll go real quick so we don't have a lot of time. Just because of the additional mental stresses of the outside world, I think coming into the home means, look, we only have so much RAM in our brains that we can use and, and be effective. So I think we should reduce our, our expectations of some of our load when, when appropriate. It's different per company. Two quick things that Riot is doing to help with this is, one, we are, we are going to have a company-wide no meeting day that is upcoming. Uh, which is going to allow folks to prioritize work. And we're also going to have a company-wide week off. So we are going to have everyone from the company disconnect and not work for a week. Uh, of course, some people will still have to, but we're going to arrange that. And that is to help with this stress and help with this pressure. And I think that's a great thing the company should consider. I love it. Great answer. So I'm going to wrap this up with one quick panel survey question again. How optimistic are you going forward on a 1 to 10 scale? Chris? I mean, I'm the I'm a natural pessimist. I am a I'm an eight. Things can't get worse than they are right now. I hope. <laughs> Ahmed, I'm a natural here. optimist. I'm ten. I I I believe I believe in humanity. I think we're we're gonna figure this out. Brett, um, I I'm probably in that eight to nine range. I think I'm a I'm a you know from a historian perspective. I think every, whether we want to call this a tragedy or not, comes greatness out of those different aspects, right? Yeah. We learned so many things rapidly. Um, these types of events, we, it's, a, it's an accelerant to a lot of things. And I think we're going to see more positive from those accelerants than negative. But it's going to be, I think it's going to be a 12 to 18 month journey. And we will have to look back on the positives of those accelerants because I think they're going to be so disruptive. Um, that I think we probably would have preferred it taken a little bit longer than to get there, but it'll, it'll be a positive outcome. I like it. Jason? I see history as a series of peaks and valleys, and we're clearly in a valley right now, and, and uh, we're not sure that we're at the bottom yet. However, uh, what usually comes after a, a, a deep valley is a major peak, and so I'm with Ahmed. I, I definitely think it, uh, uh, we're, we're looking for some positivity here over the next uh, 12 to, to 18 months. Well, if Chris is our pessimist and he's an eight, then I'm optimistic for sure. <laughs> Ten. Yeah, I guess I can't be too much of a pessimist. So I'm going <laughs> to say, there you go. I would like to thank this panel. This has been a really interesting conversation. Thank you all for your thoughtfulness and your insight. Uh, just open us to taking questions today. It's been a real pleasure. So thank you all very much. Thank you. you. Thank you for getting thank together. You, and, uh, a lot yeah, of fun. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Are we just back to the panel now, Hugo? Yeah, just back here. Uh, we're still online, so uh, attendees are quitting right now. We just uh, the video. Um, thank you so much once again, Michael, for your support and Scale Agile to be sponsoring and supporting, not just the sponsoring, but supporting is the most important. And what you have done here today with this great panel, great speakers. So really honored to have you on board. Um, we are working to, uh, with Steve Denning, so there's World Agility Forum can be uh, wider the uh, what the message we want to 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 bring to the audience uh, will be 
how we reinvent, how we re rethink uh, all the this agile space and how we uh, created an environment where all the management and the next generation uh, that uh, this disruption brought to us, uh, how we would make all this to coexist and collaborate. So I think we, uh, it would be fun to see uh, how we will collaborate um, over the next years and seeing this conference uh, growing from the scratch and it's a few um, other alliance also Phil Brock is making a huge effort and collaborating with us. Um, so I'm really honored to have you all uh, here with us uh, on this webcast. We will do it every month. Uh, it will be till 2021. We will do it uh, every month. We'll do one August, most probably. Uh, we'll close for to go for 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 a swim, uh, but we, we definitely will keep it doing. Um, and hopefully uh, by the time of the conference, we might be together for the gala dinner uh but if not uh we will make something memorable so everybody will remember what we are doing here and all the uh, all the organizations uh individuals that are uh, collaborating and helping to make that a success so from my side michael thank you so much uh also um, it's really important for the creation of scale of jobs to also to to this journey Thank you, Smart. Yeah, Hugo, my pleasure. Thanks for including me. I really enjoyed it. I'll, uh, I need to get back. I'm, I'm out, I skipped out of a meeting to do this meeting, but I, uh, I enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> that was a great panel. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you for including me. I really appreciate uh, it's it. It's a pleasure. Uh, we'll up again soon to talk about next steps, okay? Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Take care. Bye-bye.